Hi, Dr. Kat Fleece again at Central New Mexico Community College. Let's continue with the female reproductive system. We're almost done. We are going to take a look in video F at the various hormones that regulate the ovarian and uterine cycle. With the help of this figure here on your right, with these graphs I should say, we're going to learn about four major hormones two produced by the pituitary, that is the follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, and then some of the ovarian hormones, namely the estrogen and progesterone hormone, that influence or regulate the ovarian cycle and therefore also the uterine cycle. Notice that up here we have depicted the length of the follicular phase and how that corresponds to our hormone levels. In the very center here is when ovulation occurs, as indicated by this black vertical line here at day 14 of the menstrual cycle or ovarian cycle. And then we have the luteal phase, which is the time period when the corpus luteum is active. So these are the four major hormones, FSH, LH, estrogen, and progesterone. We're going to add one more here, and later on we'll add one more when we focus on the corpus luteum. The one we're adding here is one we've seen before in the male um, when we studied uh, the sp spermatogenesis and how that got started, and that is gonadotropin-releasing hormone. This hormone, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, is produced by the hypothalamus. And when it starts to increase in levels, it's going to stimulate the anterior pituitary gland to secrete follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Now this, in turn, the release of the follicle-stimulating and luteinizing hormone is then going to trigger the follicles to start producing estrogen. Now, as our follicles continue to mature, they're going to increase their levels of estrogen just somewhat, very minimally. And this low rise in estrogen is actually going to inhibit further release of FSH and LH. So you see that the levels of FSH and LH actually decline somewhat or, be or become what's somewhat stagnant. But this gives the anterior pituitary an opportunity to literally accumulate FSH and LH. And you'll see why we need suddenly a large amount of FSH and LH uh, based on these graphs. Let's explain that better. When the Graafian follicle stage is reached close to uh, day 14, or around, you know, as we're approaching day 14, notice that the estrogen levels reach their maximum levels. This has actually a positive effect on the anterior pituitary. In other words, these high levels of estrogen now stimulate, not inhibit anymore, but stimulate the anterior pituitary. And notice that we, as a result, see a very high increase in LH levels and somewhat a bump in FSH levels. But we need this big peak in LH in order for ovulation to occur. So the high levels of estrogen result in our peak in LH and that results in ovulation. Recall that during ovulation it is a secondary oocyte that is released that just barely finished meiosis 1. But once it's released, it can now move on to, to meiosis II and most specifically to metaphase II when it stops again, unless it is fertilized by a sperm cell. If we focus on the cells that are going to stay behind in the ovary, that is some of the granulosa cells and the theca cells, they're going to form the corpus luteum in the ovary. And the corpus luteum is now going to take over with the secretion of estrogen, but also progesterone and inhibin. Uh, please correct this. This is a typo, and this should be inhibin right here with an N at the end. Progesterone 
is a hormone, as you listen to the name, it says it's a hormone that prepares the uterus for gestation. Inhibin literally says it inhibits something. Well, all three of these hormones produced by the corpus luteum actually block or inhibit the further release of FSH and LH. In other words, we don't want more follicles to mature at this time, be just in the event that w the oocyte does get fertilized, we develop an embryo, that embryo then needs to be able to implant into the uterus and the uterus has to have an opportunity to prepare for that. So again, if we look at what happens right after ovulation with FSH and LH, we see that their levels drop as in the ovary, the corpus luteum takes over and estrogen levels rise, progesterone levels rise, as well as in inhibin. So you may as well add that in your list of hormones here that are going to help block further release of FSH and LH. If fertilization does not occur, then we're going to see that the um, corpus luteum is going to start deteriorating and, con and as a consequence, our estrogen levels and progesterone levels will decrease. And ultimately, that is going to uh, prevent further blockage so these hormones can start uh, raising in level again and the whole cycle can start all over again with the maturation of follicles. So the corpus luteum is literally a gland that lives within the ovary gland and for instance here we see an image that shows how big that corpus luteum can get in the ovary. It takes up most of the ovary. By the way, here we see a corpus albicans, basically a, an atrophied corpus luteum. Luteum or corpus luteum literally means yellow body and you can definitely see that it has this yellowish color to it. We see various corpus albicans here, by the way. They look like little white clouds. That's how I, how I always recognize them. So one more time, our corpus luteum produces progesterone, estrogen, and inhibin. And all of these hormones are going to prevent the anterior pituitary from produce, producing more FSH and LH, basically prevent further uh, maturation of follicles. It's therefore also going to, especially with the help of progesterone, going to help prepare the uterus in the event there is a pregnancy. If pregnancy does not occur after about 10 or 12 days uh, um, upon onset of the corpus luteum, the corpus luteum starts to degenerate and turns or becomes more like scar tissue called the corpus albicans, albicans referring to white, and you can see that they look like little white clouds, as I said and they eventually become smaller and smaller. On the other hand, if pregnancy does occur, the corpus luteum will persist, and it'll keep going until the placenta can take over after about three months. So in the earlier men, uh, images, we related the ovarian cycle to the graphs that we just studied, but we can also relate, of course, the different phases of the uterine cycle to um, these graphs. So during the time that we menstruate as girls, that is when our follicles are beginning to mature and produce low levels of estrogen. At this point in time, there is some production of FSH and LH, but that is quickly um, blocked somewhat with the rising levels in estrogen as we now are moving into what is called the proliferative phase where the uterus starts to get ready um, by producing a whole new endometrium. Once high levels of estrogen are reached, we see our LH peak resulting in ovulation 
and then that allows the secretory phase of the uterus to kick in with the help of especially the production of progesterone, which then allows for all of these glands to become active and literally prepare the uterus for gestation. So this wraps up the hormones that regulate both the ovarian as well as the uterine cycle in the female.